let's continue our discussion by looking at venous return. When you talk about venous return, you're talking about the return of blood through the veins of the body. Think about some different ways in which this could be increased. This is a good thing. The quicker you increase the return of the blood through the veins, the faster you return it to the heart, the more blood it can pump. So an increase in blood volume will help to increase this return. You got to remember that when you increase blood volume, you're going to increase pressure. Opposite would apply too. Contracting the smooth muscle in the wall of the blood vessel would be a big help. You squeeze that vein with that smooth muscle around it, the valves will prevent backflow. They'll give a faster flow back towards the heart. But skeletal muscle contraction is the best way to do this. When you contract skeletal muscles, one thing you do is squeeze some of that blood out of that muscle. And if you squeeze those veins, that's going to move it back towards the right side of the heart faster. Think about the effects of gravity on blood pressure. Anytime you're sitting upright or standing, you got this downward pull of gravity. Well, anywhere above your heart, that gravity is helping to return the blood flow back to the heart. But of course, most of our body is inferior to the heart. So gravity is working against you at any point there. And that's pretty easy to see that gravity affects your blood flow and blood pressure. Think about if you're lying down, if you jump up real fast, you get that downward pull of blood. You don't get enough pressure to your brain and might feel lightheaded for just a second. But again, muscle movement is a very good way to improve that venous return. Think about the control of blood flow through a tissue. In most tissues, blood flow will be proportional to the needs. In other words, when a tissue gets more active, it needs more blood. And primarily why you see more blood going to that tissue is to remove the waste products from that area. Think about like skeletal muscles and they get very active. Waste products build up fast. That will cause dilation of blood vessels into that area very quickly. Now, of course, the body's also trying to bring in more nutrients, but removal of the waste products is very big. It gives you a big inflow when they're active. And of course, when a tissue is not active, you see less blood flow. Nervous system has a lot to do with controlling blood flow. Think about the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions with the epinephrine, norepinephrine, and acetylcholine. Remember when that sympathetic division is activated, that fight or flight, you'll see the blood vessels dilate, in other words, get larger, into things like skeletal muscles, heart, and lungs. <clears throat> you need a lot more blood going to them at that time. But at the same time, it constricts blood vessels going into other things which you're not using at that time. So big change in blood flow. And of course, parasympathetic tends to work in an opposite way. Hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine, have a big effect on cardiac output. Definitely affects blood flow. When a tissue gets more active, you don't just see a little bit more blood going to it, but maybe eight times more. That is a very big increase in blood flow. Think about baroreceptors. This is just one thing that the body uses to know what your blood pressure is and to regulate blood pressure and blood volume and flow around the body. Baroreceptors, again, are like pressure or stretch receptors. You find these in some of the large arteries like the aorta and the internal carotids. Think about if your heart's pumping more blood into these arteries, they're going to stretch more. And if they're stretched more, they send electric signals, action potentials, back to the brain more frequently. High frequency means high pressure. That's how your brain knows when your, high, your blood pressure is higher. And then if your heart's not pushing as much blood into an artery or for some other reason it's dropping and the artery is not stretched, it sends electric signals to the brain infrequently. So the brain knows low frequency means low pressure. High frequency means high, right there. And of course, when you get changes in pressure, it can change your heart rate, stroke volume, and other factors to keep the pressure where you want it. Chemoreceptors have a lot to do with your heart rate. Breathing, too, we'll see in other chapters. They're very sensitive to chemicals like oxygen, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen ion. Think about what happens if oxygen levels drop. If you're not delivering enough oxygen to the tissues, <clears throat> you need to make your heart beat faster and harder to push more out. Just the opposite applies too. Too much oxygen going to the tissues, you'd slow the heart rate. Carbon dioxide and hydrogen are the most sensitive of the chemoreceptors. You may think it's the oxygen, but it's actually these other ones. 
your body is more worried about the pH balance of your body than it is oxygen delivery. Remember, if carbon dioxide levels go up, so does hydrogen, and a tissue gets acidic very quickly. So if the tissue gets active and more carbon dioxide is being produced, there'd be more hydrogen, and the body wants to get it out of there. Send more blood to that tissue and get it out, and of course, you'll bring in more nutrients at the same time. Look at the central nervous system ischemic response here. This results from high carbon dioxide levels in that medulla oblongata. Remember, this part of the brain stem controls vital functions like heart rate and breathing. If you ever don't have adequate blood flow to this part of the brain, and that CO2 builds up and those oxygen levels drop, that is when the body can send your blood pressure very, very high, at least in an attempt to, it will. Again, you don't really want to see your heart rate above about 190 because above that beats per minute gets very insufficient, very inefficient. But it can get as high as 250 or maybe 300. And if somebody's heart rate gets that high, it's probably because that brain stem is not getting enough blood. So if that blood pressure drops to about half of what it should be, that's usually when that happens right there. Look at some of the hormones like aldosterone. Remember aldosterone, one thing it does here is target the kidneys, telling it to hold sodium and water. Well, if the body starts to hold water, that'll raise your blood pressure. This is a hormone definitely has an effect on your blood pressure. Less of this hormone would do the opposite, lower your blood pressure. Vasopressin, also called ADH. Remember, diuretics cause you to lose water. Anti-diuretic causes you to hold it. So if you release this hormone from the posterior pituitary, it tells the kidneys to hold sodium and water. That'll raise your pressure. Just the opposite applies too. Atrial natriuretic hormone coming from the right atrium of the heart. Now this hormone works opposite of what these others did. This hormone is released when blood pressure is high. Whenever blood pressure is high and that right atrial wall is stretched more, more atrial natriuretic hormone is released. And that tells the kidneys to release water, which of course will lower the pressure there. Fluid shift mechanism. This just tells you here that when your blood pressure is high, you tend to force more fluid out into the tissues. And when your blood pressure drops, that fluid tends to move back into it. Helps to stabilize your blood pressure. Shows you that your tissues act a bit as a reservoir for water when you need it. Helps to balance blood pressure too. And this stress relaxation response discusses the changing in blood vessel diameter to regulate the pressure. You can constantly change the size of those blood vessels by constricting or relaxing the smooth muscle in the wall to keep the pressure right where you need it. So here's some of your pictures once again and the links to the guide.